Um, I get the honor of continuing our Circle Maker series. This is one of our favorite series, the, th the third time that we've done it here at chapel, and it's just talking about prayer. And so from the very beginning, I want us to pray because I believe that God has a life-changing word for us today because there's so much power in prayer. And so as we pray, I want us just to, to put our focus on what God wants to say in this word today and pray against every distraction. And I believe that God has a life-changing message today. God, we thank you. Thank you for the investment of people's time, talent, and treasure all over this campus. And thank you for the people that I have the honor of sharing your word with today. Now, God, I pray that your word would prick and move and convict and stir our hearts today, God, to dream bigger, to believe for greater things. The fact that we are here today breathing air, given life by you, there is still more for us to do. And so I pray today, God, that the hearts of your people would be stirred, moved, challenged, to dream bigger, to pray bigger. Let our faith be strengthened today, God. And we're going to celebrate all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you are about to do in and through us in Jesus' name. Would you say, I believe that, I receive that, now say, in my life, in my life. So last Sunday, Pastor launched the Circle Maker series, and he talked about circling what matters. He taught us that bold prayers honor God, and that God honors bold prayers. And there was a handout. Do we have those handouts, the, the paper handouts? If you did not get a circle last week, would you hold that up, the circle? Would you hold those up last Sunday if you were not here or you did not get a circle? You'll understand why in just a minute, but from the onset... If you would just raise your hand, I want everyone to have one of these circles, and this is a huge part of the series. Thank you. Hold your hand up till they come. And Pastor laid the groundwork last Sunday. If you were not here, I encourage you to go online and grab that message. But he talked about where the circle maker came from, and it was a man by the name of Honai that got into a circle and began to pray for rain. And before the first raindrop fell, I believe that Honai had to feel a little foolish, he was standing inside a circle and demanding rain that had not been rain for years. It was a drought. That had to be a risky proposition. And he was vowing not only in this circle that he drew, he drew a circle and he said, now last Sunday, Pastor, you did that about three or four times and I just got dizzy watching you. I'm going to draw one because I'm in heels today. But he drew a circle and in fact, he said, not only was he asking God for the miraculous rain, but he said, I'm not going out of this circle until it rains. That's quite some faith. Honai, here's the thing about Honai. He did not draw a semicircle, which is what a lot of us do. And we give a little out. And we say, I believe that God can do it, but not my will, but God's will be done. Whatever God wants to do, and we leave a little semicircle and an exit strategy, and then we say, well, I've been praying for rain for seven days. I guess God doesn't want it to rain. But Honai didn't draw that kind of circle. Honai drew a circle, and there was no open end. It was a closed circle. There was no escape clause in Honai's prayer. There was no expiration date. Honai put himself into a circle, and the only way out of that circle was the miracle he was asking God for. Because drawing prayer circles often looks like an exercise in foolishness. As we go further in this series, you're going to notice that drawing prayer circles often makes you feel a little bit foolish. But I've come to tell you today, I think that that's faith. The very de definition of faith is that faith is the willingness to look foolish. Noah, he looked foolish. Building a boat... In the middle of dry land, there was no water in sight. The Israelite army had to look a little foolish, marching around Jericho, blowing trumpets to knock down a wall. The shepherd boy named David, he had to look a little foolish, charging a giant with a slingshot and five smooth stones. I believe the wise men looked foolish, tracking a star to Timbuktu somewhere. I believe that Peter looked foolish in the middle of the sea, in the middle of a storm, stepping out on a boat and believing that he could walk on water. And I believe that Jesus looked a little foolish, hanging on a cross with a crown of thorns on his head. But the results speak for themselves. 
Noah was saved from the flood and his family. The walls came tumbling down. David defeated Goliath with just one of those stones. The wise men discovered the Messiah. Peter walked on water. And Jesus was crowned our King of Kings. The results speak for themselves. <laughs> Foolishness is a feeling that Moses in the Old Testament was very familiar with. Moses had to feel foolish going before the wicked Pharaoh and demanding that Pharaoh let God's people go. He had to feel foolish sticking his staff across the Red Sea and the waters parting and they marched through on dry ground. He most certainly felt foolish promising meat to eat to the entire nation of Israel in the middle of a wilderness. But it was Moses' foolishness that resulted in epic miracles. It was Moses' foolishness that resulted in the exodus out of Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, and then the quail miracle that we'll talk about in a minute. Because drawing prayer circles often feels foolish. And the bigger the circle you draw, the more foolish you're going to feel. But if you aren't willing to step out of the boat, you're never going to walk on water. And if you aren't willing to circle the city, the city walls, they're never going to fall. And if you aren't willing to follow a star, you're going to miss out on the greatest adventure of your life. And so I tell us today that in order to experience a miracle, we must, we must, you have to take a risk. One of the most difficult types of risks that you're going to risk, that you're going to take, is risking your reputation. Honai already had a reputation as a rainmaker, but he was willing to risk his reputation by praying for rain. Listen, one more time. Honai took the risk, and history is now formed, and we're still talking about it. The greatest chapters in history will always begin with risk. The greatest chapters in history begin with risk, and the same is true in the chapters of your lives. Because if you're unwilling to risk your reputation, you will never build a boat like Noah, and you'll never have an experience like Peter. You cannot build God's reputation. You cannot build God's reputation if you're not willing to risk yours. Circle makers, may I tell you today, are risk takers. We at Chapel North, we learned this lesson nearly five, almost six years ago, that if you don't take the risk, you forfeit the miracle. Pastor and I had been here for eight years. We used to be over on Tussock Street, about four miles from here. And it was just under six acres of land. The building was about 4,200 square feet. And you didn't have all this space. In fact, if you sat on the front row, we were often showered by the praise singers. Spit just everywhere. Like worship like this. It's small. There's 124 chairs packed in there. One aisle. We squeeze all down the sides to have two. We had a couple of classrooms, a couple of bathrooms. It was small. We outgrew that facility. And one of our board members at the time drove by this facility, and it had a for sale sign. And Pastor and I came over, and we drove the property, and honestly, we said, no way. That is out of our range. Call, we were thinking probably three mil. Call, they wanted 1.475. Still out of our range. Everything was like quadruple what we were paying at the time. And we were doing this crazy series called The Circle Maker. And we started negotiations, a 15 month of negotiations. And about four to six months into that, we began to come over here and literally circle the property, oftentimes by foot, and pretty much every single day. One of us, if not our family, would walk this property and circle it in prayer. And we closed on this property for $814,000. And the only debt that Chapel has is this mortgage, and that is it. Every single thing on this property is paid for. That is what happens when you take risk and you begin to circle things in prayer. God does what you and I cannot do. Numbers chapter 11 in the Old Testament is an amazing story. And it's talking about the slavery and how 400 years of slavery, God delivers the Israelites out of Egypt after 400 years of slavery. But when we're reading this story, we find out that it's much harder getting the Israelites Getting, the, getting Egypt out of the Israelites than it is getting the Israelites out of Egypt. we got to get that mentality out of them, that slave mentality out of them. And despite the memories of slavery that they have, 400 years in slavery, 
despite the miracles of deliverance, the Israelites want to go back to Egypt. We'll start at Numbers chapter 11 and verse 1. It says, now the people complained about their hardship. Do you realize they are out of Egypt and they are complaining about their hardship? Verse 4, if only, listen to their hardship, if only we had meat to eat. If only we had meat to eat, we remember. What did they remember? Not the 400 years of slavery, not the torture, the anguish, the toil. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt, y'all, at no cost. Also, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now we have lost our appetites. We never see anything but this manna. Sidebar. Do you know that complaining is to Satan what worship is to God? Complaining is to Satan what worship is to God. Now, here they are complaining about what they're going to eat. Talk about selective memories. The Israelites longingly remember the free fish that they ate in Egypt, and they forgot this little fact that the food was free because they weren't. The Israelites weren't just slaves. They had been victims of genocide, yet they missed the meat on the menu. And isn't it just a little ironic that the Israelites were complaining about one miracle while asking for another one? Their capacity for complaining is astounding to me. We scoff at the Israelites. We preach about them grumbling and mumbling and complaining. But don't we do the same thing? There are miracles all around us every single day. Yet it's so easy to find something to complain about in the midst of those miracles. Do you know that the simple act of reading involves millions of impulses firing across billions of synapses? While you're reading, your heart goes about its business, listen, circulating five quarts of blood through 100,000 miles of veins, arteries, and capillaries. And it's amazing that you can even concentrate given the fact that you're on a planet that is traveling 67,000 miles through space while spinning around its axis at a speed of 1,000 miles per hour. But we take these manna miracles, the miracles that happen every day, in and out, day in and day out, we take them for granted. Despite their incessant complaining, God patiently responds to the Israelites. He responds to their food tantrum with one of the most unfathomable promises in Scripture. He doesn't just promise a one-course meal of meat. God promises them meat for a month. And Moses can hardly believe it, literally. Moses, here I am, among 600,000 men on foot, and you say, I will give you meat to eat for a whole month? Moses is trying to do the math, and it just doesn't add up, not even close. He's trying to think of any conceivable way that God could fulfill this promise, and he can't even think of a single scenario that God can do this one day, let alone 30 days. He doesn't see how God can fulfill this impossible promise. Have you ever been there? A job change? A career change? Less pay, but a better opportunity? It just doesn't add up. I should go on a missions trip? Me, go out of the country? I can't even afford. I can't even afford to go to downtown Columbus. And now I'm going to go to another country? It just doesn't add up. I need to get out of debt. I feel to get out of debt. I don't even know how in the world to do it. It just doesn't add up. Stay in this marriage, Moida? I'm exhausted. I've been trying too hard. I've been doing all the work. And now you're telling me that there's a miraculous that could happen? It just doesn't add up. Mike, I have this dream of owning my own company. And it seems pretty impossible were the words you told us three years ago. It doesn't add up. Come here, Mike. Three years ago, I love this story. Mike Giamarco, one of Chapel's own, three years ago, Mike, I think you stood right about here, and we had pieces of paper. Do you have that piece of paper still? Check this out. I can't make this stuff up good enough, guys. Three years ago, we did a lesson in it, on Circle Maker, and it said, my big dream, my big prayer. 
and three years ago, you stood right here on this altar and you wrote down, to own the company I work for. You stuck that in your wallet and you began to circle that. One Sunday, pastor had the hula hoops and you boldly walked up here and stood in that circle. And can you turn around and tell the audience what's happened now? I now own the company. I'll put a shameless plug here. He owns G&G &G Concrete, and he owns it. Owns all the machinery, all the equipment, the shop, and now his big prayer is, God, help me manage it. <laughs> big, bold prayers that honor God. Thank you for being here. You know what I love about Mike Giamarco's story? is that God blessed him exceedingly abundantly above all that he could ask or think. Do you know that chapel as a result is blessed? Because every winter we used to spend hundreds of dollars getting someone to pay, to pay in Jesus' name. <laughs> getting someone to plow during the snow. This guy comes and he plows and salts it and doesn't charge chapel a penny. Thank you for that. Because God knew, Mike, that he can trust you to be a conduit that he would flow in and through. And that as God blesses you, you bless the local church, you bless the community, you bless us. That is what God does when we pray bold prayers. Not that we hoard it all, but that we would use it for his kingdom. And so I ask you today, what is the step of faith that you need to take in pursuing your big dream? What is the radical step of faith that you need to take? I wish that it was just as easy as saying we had 15 months of... of um, of, what's the word I'm looking for? Willing and dealing is not the right word. That's a, I'm from the South. Negotiations. Coming over here. But in fact, we had sold the Tussock property. <laughs> Our board didn't even know at the time that this place was, uh, we, had, we had entered into a little bit of a um, challenge. Unbeknownst to us, they had sold the rights of this property out here. Well, we didn't know it. So we're under contract, and they've sold the rights to the two, it's our property, but we don't have the rights to it. Uh, crazy, that's a story for another day. And so here we are two weeks without a building. Like, we have to be out of this building, we're out of contract here, and literally, talk about bold, we couldn't even tell the board. We were like, what? Talk about questioning yourself. And I would lay on the floor and cry and pray, God, we would start, we would start driving the city, where are we going to next? We couldn't even tell anybody for two weeks. We had nothing, no building. We were, we were, this contract was done. This one fell through. And I remember laying with the Bible. Because remember pastor talked to us last week? Don't just read the promises of God in the Bible. Circle the promises of God and pray them. And I was laying on my floor crying and praying, God, have we messed up? Did we miss it? The Lord said, was that me? And I get to Psalms chapter 37. And it says, trust in the Lord and keep his way. And he will exalt you to inherit the land. And I began to circle that promise. And I came, I came home one day, I was just in a preacher of my spirit, and I said, baby, do you believe that God promised us that land? Do you believe that that land is chapels? And he said, I do, I do, but whatever God wills. No, 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 there's no but. We have to have a whole circle. We can't have an open circle. Do you believe? And he's like, I, I think I do. No, 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 not think. Are you sure? <laughs> we got to be sure. And do you know for two weeks we began to circle that promise, come over here every single day, keep walking, and guess what? God did it. To think that your dream, Mike, is not going to come without a cost. Circle makers are risk takers. Let me, let me finish this out here with one more miracle in Numbers chapter 11. Listen to what God does. Numbers chapter 11, verse 31. Now a wind went out from the Lord and drove quail in from the sea. It scattered them up to two cubits deep all around the camp as far as a day's walk in any direction. All that day and night and all the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than ten homers. Y'all got to let me do a little history lesson for you. As I dug in on this, listen, the Israelites were parked in the wilderness of Paran, a region about 50 miles inland from the Mediterranean Sea, 50 miles southwest of the Dead Sea. Here's the significance of this. Quail tend to live by the water, and quail do not fly long distances. If it weren't for a supernatural west wind, they would have never made it this far inland. So now we have a meteorological miracle. And it's not just a miraculous west wind. Listen, the clouds burst and rain quail from the sky. 
Like, this is the stuff that movies are made from, guys. Based on the Hebrew system of measurement, a day's walk was approximately 15 miles in any direction. So now let's do some math. I didn't do real good in math, but I know that if you square the radius and multiply by pi, we're talking about an area that was almost 700 square miles. To put that in perspective, Washington, D.C. is 68.3 square miles. And not only is that an area that is 10 times larger than the nation's capital, the quail were piled three feet deep. Can you imagine seeing that many birds fly into the camp? I struggle already with these geese out here and all that they leave. It's like a bird blizzard. It was like quail Mageddon had hit. The clouds of bird was so massive that it had to seem like a solar eclipse. And once the quail stopped falling, the Israelites started gathering. Each Israelite gathered no less than 10 homers. Now here we go again. 10 homers multiplied by 600,000 men equals 6 million homers at a minimum. And Homer equated to roughly 200 liters. And assuming that the quail were of any average size, it ranged somewhere in the neighborhood of 105 million quail in one day. 105 million quail. Can I tell you that God doesn't just provide in dramatic fashion? Mike, God provides in dramatic proportion. So much so that we have to be careful what we dream for and what we ask for. And then we got to pray, God, now please help me to sustain the dramatic proportion to which you blessed me. Moses could have never anticipated this answer to prayer. It was unpredictable. It was unprecedented. But Moses had the guts to circle the promise anyway. And when you circle the promise, you never know how God will provide. But it always looks like cloudy with a chance of quail. <laughs> May I ask you this today? What promise do you need to circle? What dream do you need to circle? I was so moved last Sunday standing in the lobby as people were coming up to us after both services and telling us what they had put in their circle. I am so confident that God is going to perform the miraculous over the next several weeks. I heard people telling me how they're praying for their spouse, how they're praying for their children, how they're praying for finances, how there are so many things written in that circle, so much faith and belief in God. Again, some people telling me that they had long gone past this dream or this promise, and now God was renewing it, and they were putting it in the circle. Maybe you need a circle around your marriage. Maybe you need a circle around your children. Maybe you need a circle around this stage of your life, a fear that you are facing, a dream you're pursuing, the constant and persistent financial strain. Andre, last year we did Make Room for Real, which is our pledges that we do every year, giving over and above our tithe and offering for missions projects and a number of things that happen around chapel. And I remember you sharing the story that you had one amount and you felt to double that. And he was like, I don't know how, it, I don't know how it's going to happen. You did it and you got a raise. You did it again the second year, right? You doubled that amount and you got a raise. Went from being $8.50 an hour, taking plants to people's cars. I know you want to tell me because I'm not saying it right. He's going, not that. <laughs> Shipping plants to where now being one of the managers at the facility in just four years, five years. In fact, went through a significant church hurt, had nothing to do with God or church for about six years, I guess, significantly hurt, stood over here one Sunday morning and the presence of God was moving and I felt the presence of God move and I saw Andre lower his hands. After church, I asked him, Andre, have you ever had a call of God on your life? And he said, it's interesting that you tell me that. He said, because I felt the Lord calling me again that Sunday and I said, absolutely not, I'll never do it again. But can I tell you, this young man's been in our life for 20 years, and we have circled him with prayer and prayer and prayer. And 20 years later, he now stands on this platform leading this amazing team in worship. Can I tell you, you can't stop circling, chapel. You can't stop circling. There's a miraculous that lies inside the circle. Draw a whole circle and don't leave an exit. And just believe that God is the God of miracles. Two, two, two hours 
two hours, for two years he's been coming here. He lives on the other side of Dayton. By the time you're home, you've had a nap, you've ate lunch, and you're getting ready for dinner, this young man's getting home. And every Saturday he drives two hours one way, does a rehearsal, gets here. He's here at 545, 6 o'clock every Sunday morning, leaves by probably 233, drives two hours home. But when I tell you when God's done what he's done in your life, there's no drive to a church alive is worth the drive. Before the quail storm appeared on the Doppler radar, God asked Moses a question. And here's my closing thought. It's actually more than a question. It's the question for all of us today. In fact, your answer to this question will determine the size of your prayer circles. He asked Moses, Moses, is there any limit to my power? Is there any limit to my power? The obvious answer to the question is no. God is omnipotent, which means by definition, there is nothing God cannot do. Yet many of us pray as if our problems are bigger than our God. So let me remind you of this high octane truth that I believe will fuel your faith today. God is not only bigger, God is infinitely bigger than your biggest problem or dream. God is not only bigger, God is infinitely bigger, infinitely bigger than your greatest problem or your greatest dream. And while we're on the topic, may I remind you that God's grace is infinitely greater, infinitely bigger than any sin that you have ever committed. Renowned author A.W. Tozer said, I believe that a low view of God is the cause of a hundred lesser evils. But a high view of God is the solution to 10,000 temporal problems. A low view of God is the cause of a hundred lesser evils. But a high view of God is the solution to 10,000 temporal problems. And if it's true, I believe that it is, then your biggest problem is not an impending divorce. It's not a failing business. It's not a doctor's diagnosis. Please understand, I'm not making light. I'm not making light of your relational, your financial, or your health issues. I certainly don't want to minimize the overwhelming challenges that so many of you are facing today. But in order to regain a godly perspective on our problems, we have to answer this one question. Are your problems bigger than God? Or is God bigger than your problems? Are your problems bigger than God? Or is God bigger than your problems? Our biggest problem is our small view of God. And that is the cause of all of our lesser evils. It's a high view of God that is the solution to all other problems. And I ask today, is there any limit to God's power? There's only two answers. It's yes or it's no. And until we come to the conviction that God's grace and power knows no limit... We will just keep drawing small circles that are open-ended. But once we embrace the omnipotent, the all-powerful God, we'll draw ever-enlarging circles around our God-given, God-sized dreams. How big is your God? How big is your God? Is he big enough to heal your marriage? Is he big enough to save your child? Is he bigger than a positive MRI or a negative evaluation? Is he bigger than your hidden sin or your secret dream? How big is your God? Moses was perplexed by the promise God had given him. How could God possibly provide me for a month? It just doesn't add up. Mike G., how could you possibly ever be able to afford to own the business you worked for? It just didn't add up. Andre, how could you ever continue to double financially and to keep traveling that distance? It just didn't add up. But at that critical juncture, when you had to decide whether or not to circle the promise, to circle the dream, God posed the question, Mike, is there any limit to my power? Andre, is there any limit to my power? Pastor Crystal, is there any limit to God's power? Is there any limit to God's power? There is no limit to God's power. 
so your promises seem impossible. But the size of your prayers depends on the size of your God. And if God knows no limit, then neither should your prayers. Because God exists outside of the four space-time dimensions that he created. We have to pray that way. It kind of reminds me of a man who was sizing God up. God, how long is a million years to you? And God said, a million years is like a second to me. Then the man asked, how much is a million dollars to you? God said, a million dollars is like a penny. The man smiled and said, could you spare a penny? And God smiled back and said, sure, just wait a second. (laughs) There's no limit to God's power. In fact, one small step became one giant leap. One small step, Mike, seemingly small step to the front. Seemingly insignificant of writing it on a paper. Seemingly insignificant of praying the same prayer day after day after day. Seemingly insignificant of of taking a hula hoop. My daughter got these for me. She's blingy. Of taking a hula hoop in an altar. Taking a few steps. Standing in a piece of plastic. One small step became one giant leap. Chapel, one small step from Tuffick became one giant leap to where we are today. And here's what I know. When God gives a vision, he always makes provision. When God gives you a vision, when God gives you a dream, when God gives you a promise, he will always make the provision. We just have to have the courage to step out in faith. Otherwise, we forfeit the miracle. So here's what we're going to do in our closing moment. All over the room, if you would stand. I only have three hula hoops. May the first ones win. I want to believe that there's bigger dreams and promises in this room, way more than three. But where are the three bold souls that would say, I believe what God did for Mike G, he can do for me. I believe what God did for Andre Prossman, he can do for me. Would you close your eyes? God, let faith build in this house right now. I feel so much faith. Let it build in this place right now, God. Let it build in this place. Let them be reminded. What step of faith do you need to take? What decision do you need to make? On what promise do you need to put down a stake? Here is what I'm confident of, chapel. The size of your prayer says a lot about your faith. Your prayer requests will become your praise report if you don't give up. So the biggest challenge is not even your issue that you're thinking of right now. That is not your biggest challenge. Your biggest challenge is your faith. Your biggest challenge is your attitude, your belief. God, all over this room, you're stirring hearts and lives. I thank you for what you're doing in this room right now. I thank you for dreams that are coming to life all over this place. There's ministries that you're calling people back to. There's more Andres in this room, God. There's more Mike G's in this room. There's more Bruce Galoglis in this room. Man, God, you've been so good to us. You're not finished yet. And so I pray, God, in the closing moments that your sons and your daughters would be so bold in their faith that in just a moment, I believe people are going to step out of their seats, come forward, and they're going to stand in circles. They're going to write things in their circle that they're not even going to show anybody because it sounds like foolishness. Come Holy Spirit.